This is, uh, section is section 2.2. .2. I guess I should write that somewhere. Maybe I'll squeeze it in right there. Section 2.2 .2 over polynomial functions of higher degree. So let's first just do a quick, uh, I guess, recall of what a polynomial function looks like. Um, polynomial function starts off with a to the first, or a sub, sub 1, x to the m. Now, that is your first leading term. So n represents the degree, and n, again, is going to be the largest exponent. So n represents the degree, and a sub 1 is your leading coefficient. Then after that, you have other coefficients and other um, variables as well. But notice that the degree is always going down. And then we can continue this pattern, um, really, all the way down till we have a single coefficient, and we'll call that a to the n, a, I, uh, you know, a single value. So let me give you a quick example here of a polynomial function, something like uh, negative 5x to the 7th plus 3x to the 4th minus 2x to the 3rd plus 1 half x minus 8. So the, uh, notice how we skip some, so there's a degree of 7, then we go 5, then there's a 4, 3, no 2, then there's a 1 right here, and then down to 0. So that's how you determine uh, kind of what a function looks like. And notice I made one of these coefficients a fraction here, just so you realize they do not have to be whole numbers. Um, one key aspect about all polynomial functions is, that, is they are what we call continuous. And what we mean by continuous is that when you take a look at their graph, a continuous function that is a polynomial is a polynomial that's going to do some of this stuff here and not 100% certain by looking at exactly what it's going to do, but something like that. So that's what makes it a continuous function. A non-continuous function would be a function that maybe has a gap, so it kind of goes like this and then it has a big gap in the graph, and then it continues, something like that. That's a gap in the um, function, so that's not a polynomial. Another one is basically a whole. We'll learn about more about these a little bit later on, but literally a function that just has a hole. I mean, there's literally a hole in the graph right there, just like a point taken out. That's not continuous. Basically, if you have to pick up your pen in order to draw it, it's not continuous. This first one right here that is continuous, I can draw that smoothly without lifting up my pen. So that makes continuous functions, which are polynomials. Also, they cannot have sharp turns. So this is an absolute value function. It's real sharp like that. That right there is not considered a polynomial. Even though you could draw it without, you know, continuously and draw it without picking up your pencil, it does have a sharp turn. So that's not a polynomial function. So anyway, we can learn an awful lot from polynomial functions. And one important thing we do is what we do what's called the leading coefficient test. And it's kind of long coefficient. I'm just going to abbreviate coefficient. The leading coefficient test. So the leading coefficient the degree tells an awful lot. So when we got this coefficient, or we got this polynomial, remember that very first coefficient, a sub 1, and then x to the n. Now remember, it's not always going to come first. It could be mixed up. But you've got to look at what coefficient is with the largest exponent. So n is your degree. And this is what we call your leading coefficient. So that puts us into four cases. So the first case is we want to um, think about is if n, uh, the degree, is even. Okay, so if the degree is even, and that's n, I'll put degree there. If the degree is even, the neat thing about what we call the end behaviors, what's the graph doing on the end? They're both going in the same direction. So we have graphs that kind of look like a parabola here but not necessarily, because we don't know what's going on in the middle. We're not, not sure how many turns and twists there are in the middle, but we do know that both ends are going in the same direction. So this is a case where they're both going up, and we could also draw a case here where both ends are going down. And maybe there's a couple more turns in there in the middle. Kind of looks like an Arby sat there. But anyway, both ends are going down. So either both ends up, both ends at down. And you know that if the degree is even. Now, if they're both up, their leading coefficient, a sub 1, is greater than 0, meaning positive. If they're both going down, your leading coefficient, a sub 1, is less than 0. So leading coefficient, if is positive and your degree is even, both ends are going up. Who knows about the middle? Both ends are going down if your leading coefficient is negative. The second case we want to talk about here is if the degree n is odd. And again, this is all called end behavior. What's the graphs doing on the ends? And then we're talking about those arrows at the ends. 
So these ones are going straight up towards infinity. These ones are going straight down towards negative infinity. So if the degree n, once again, I'll put degree there so you remember what we're talking about. The degree is odd. Then one side is going up, one side is going down. So we could have a graph like this where the left side is going down. Who knows what's happening in the middle? It really could be anything. And then the right-hand side is going up. The other option here is that the right, le excuse me, left-hand side is up. And the middle, who knows what's going on, and the right-hand side is going down. If the fleeting coefficient is positive, meaning greater than zero, positive, and um, you're odd, again, degrees odd, left going down, right going up. If the leading coefficient is negative, less than zero, negative, then the left-hand side's going up, the right-hand side's going down. So there is a uh, specific notation for how we like to give this. For example, if we're talking about what's a graph doing to the right, and any one of these four graphs to the right would be obviously towards the positive x values. So we say as x goes to the right towards infinity, what is the function doing? And um, that you kind of have to fill in depending. For example, as x goes to the right towards infinity this way, the function is going up towards infinity. In this case, as the function, or as x goes to the right towards infinity, the function is going down towards negative infinity. So the answer that you would put right here all depends. Okay, you got to look at the graph. If you are uh, in this category here where n is odd, and the leading coefficient is positive. As x gets bigger towards infinity, the function itself is going up towards positive infinity as well. But if it's the opposite and the leading coefficient is negative, as x gets bigger or goes towards infinity, the function itself is going down. And then you also have to look at the other side, and that is as x approaches negative infinity. And then you're concerned about what is f of x doing. Again, and that answer is going to depend. So you're always concerned what happens as x goes to the right, that's infinity. What happens as x goes to the left, that's negative infinity. Where's the function going? Is the function going up? In this case, they're both going up, so they'd both be infinity. In this case, they're both going down, so they'd both be negative infinity. Over here, we're going to have to switch them. So if n is odd and your leading coefficient is positive, the right-hand side is going up towards infinity. The left-hand side is going down towards negative infinity. Um, if we have a negative leading coefficient, the right-hand side towards the right is going down towards negative infinity right here. The left-hand side is going up towards positive infinity. So that's the leading coefficient test. It tells us what the graph is doing on the ends. It all depends upon the degree. and um, the positive or negativeness, I guess, <laughs> of the leading coefficient. Um, next up, when we're talking about any of these polynomials, we want to talk about what zeros are. Zeros are really, really important in pre-calculus. Um, another word for zeros, we call them solutions. It's another word for a zero. And a, uh, another word we even use is an x-intercept. An x-intercept is the same thing as a zero. So it's important to understand what a zero is. A zero is simply a value a that makes a function zero. So any value that you place into um, a function and it turns it into zero. So whenever f of a equals zero. So if plugging in a makes the function zero, then you have what's called a zero. Pretty easy. Um, and when you look at a polynomial, the degree, which is n, is really kind of important because that degree n tells us two things. It tells us first that the function has at most n real zeros. Now, real zeros, the opposite of a real zero is an imaginary zero, which we're not going to talk about quite yet, but real zeros are actual numbers. So again, if you have a function that has a degree of four, there could be at most four real zeros. There could be four, three, two, one, or there could be none, but there cannot be um, five or six or seven. And it also tells us that there are at most n minus one turns. Okay, what I mean by turns is like if you're drawing a polynomial, there's one turn, two turn, three turns. So this polynomial right here is one, 
two, three turns. So based upon the degree, again, again, if your degree is four, four minus one is three, there could be at most three turns. So three, two, or one. So this graph right here could be uh, the polynomial we're talking about if you have four, because it has three turns, which would be allowed. And again, it's only allowed at most n real zeros. So that's also some stuff you can learn. It's important to understand what a zero is. Um, now, to further explain what a zero is, um, if you're thinking about a function, right, okay, thinking about a function f of x, we claim that x equals a is a zero if you plug in a and you get zero. Pretty easy. We say that x equals a is a solution if you plug it in and you get a zero. We also say that x minus a is a factor, and that's where a lot of kids get confused on this whole idea of a factor. But remember, a factor means you go into a number with a remainder of <laughs> zero. So you go into it evenly. That's why factors and zeros have a lot in common. And also, a comma zero would be the x-intercept because, um, you know, you guys understand that points say if I take this x and plug it in, I better get this y. So if I take the x a and I plug it in and get zero, then I'm a zero, which also means I'm an x-intercept. Okay? So let's take a look at a function that's already in what we call factored form. So like x minus 2 times x plus 6. Okay? This is a real easy um uh, polynomial to analyze real quick because everybody in this room should know right away that that means x equals 2 is a 0 and then x equals negative 6 is a 0. I mean, for crying out loud, 2 minus 2 is 0, 0 times anything is 0, negative 6 plus 6 is 0, 0 times anything is 0. So that's why they're going to create zeros. Um, so those are zeros. They're also solutions. That makes x minus 2 a factor. Why? Because when I plug in 2, I get 0 x plus 6 is a factor. Why? Because when I plug in negative 6, I get 0. The um, y-intercepts would be at 2 comma 0 and at negative 6 comma 0. So if I kind of saw a quick graph of this right here at 2, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right down here at 6, negative 6 it is, that's where the graph would cross the x-axis. And those would become my zeros. Um, and you could actually go and expand this out. This would be x squared plus 4x minus 12. That would be the uh, actual polynomial, the way it looks. And again, once you're factored, it's a lot easier to determine zeros. So what am I trying to get at? If you want to find zeros, make sure you're factored because it's a lot easier and cleaner to kind of find the two or more zeros if you're in what we call factored form. So hopefully um, all that sounds pretty easy. Um, we're going to take a look at another example real quick here. Let's look at this example. f of x equals negative 2x to the fourth plus 2x squared. Now, once again, if I want to find the zeros of this, I have to factor it. It is the easiest way to find the zeros. And again, when you're finding zeros, you want to determine what makes this function zeros. That's why we usually put a zero right there. So let's see here. I notice that there's a uh, negative 2 I could take out. I could take out a negative 2. I could also take out an x squared to factor. When I take a negative 2 out of this first guy, I just get a 1 there, x squared. Again, negative 2x squared times x squared makes a negative 2x to the fourth. Back here, I need a minus sign because I'm taking out a negative 2. And I just really have a 1 right there, I guess, because uh, the 2 came out and the x squared came out. And again, y negative because two negatives would make that positive. And I could actually continue to factor this. So negative 2x squared. And then I, that's going to make x minus 1 times x plus 1. That is one of our difference of perfect squares. So if everybody recognizes that. So if I said real quick, what are the zeros? Looking right here, x equals negative 1 is a 0 or a solution or an x-intercept. Here's my factor. Uh, looking right here, I got x equals positive 1 is my 0 or my solution or my x-intercept. Here's the factor. And don't forget about this front guy as well. Negative 2x squared equals 0. That's about the easiest equation to solve. Divide both sides by negative 2. You get x squared equals 0. Square root, square root, and the square root of 0 is 0. So looking up there gives us one more 0 of zero. So this particular graph has three zeros, zero, one, and negative one. Very easy to see once you're in factored form. 
Now, the last thing I want to talk about real quick here is what we call um, repeated zeros. Repeated zeros occur when you have a factor with an exponent on it. Okay, like right here, we have a factor x with an exponent on it. Okay, right here, there's a 1 right here and a 1 right here, but repeated zeros occur when you have like a 2 or a 3 right here. So let me kind of go, go over a real quick example here. If I had a function and once I factored it, it was x plus 4 to the third. So if I'm looking right here, I have one zero at x equals negative four, but that zero got repeated three times. And how many times this, uh, you know, how many times it's repeated tells us a lot about what that function's doing. If it's repeated an odd number of times, that means that you cross at that zero. So the actual graph will cross the graph at that zero. So at negative four, negative four is going to be somewhere over here, right? The negative side. The graph actually crosses. If the um, re the you know repetition of the zero is even, so let's just say we scribbled this out real quick and made it a four. That means that we touch at that zero. And what I mean by touch is here's negative four right here. Instead of crossing, I come down and touch. I don't go through. I just touch that little point right there. All right. So like if I'm looking at this, the x plus one is repeated once. That's odd. So I'm going to cross at negative one. Uh, again, odd right here. I'm going to cross at one. But this right here was a square. So this zero got repeated twice. There's still only one zero. But all that means is that I'm going to touch. So if we kind of think about this graph, here's zero, here's one right here, here's negative one right here. I'm going to cross, touch, and then cross. So that's a, definitely what my graph could look like. But to be quite honest, because it has that negative coefficient out in front, it's actually going down. So here's the true graph that I'm looking at. Cross, touch, cross. Kind of looks like that Arby's hat again. So touch, or I'm sorry, cross touch here at zero and cross. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we'll take a look at one more example here just so everybody could see it and that is f of x equals negative 2x cubed plus 6x squared minus 9 halves x. Now this is going to be a tricky one and kind of an ugly one but I'm going to factor this, factor it. I'm looking for zeros. Let's see, I could factor out an x for sure and what also can I factor out? I don't like this fraction, so let's factor out a one-half. Let's factor out a one-half. Let's factor out a negative, because I don't like negative signs either. I might as well take them out, and let's factor out an x. So two divided by one-half is going to be four. Positive four, again, just double check. Negative one-half times four is negative two. x squared plus 12 x, again, negative 1 half times 12 would make that 6. Actually, it's going to need to be a negative 12 because the two negatives are going to make a positive. And this is going to be a positive 9. So that should make a lot of sense. Hopefully, that was pretty easy. Um, and again, and that's because I took out that 1 half. should be easy to check. 1 half times 4 is 2. 1 half times 12 is 6. 1 half times 9 is 9 halves. But I did take out the negative, so positive, negative, positive now. So let's continue factoring here. And let's see here how to, ooh, what I noticed is different and some squares here. Four is a perfect square, so 2x and 2x. Nine is a perfect square, so 3 and 3. And this makes sense. If I make them both negative, I'm going to get a negative 6x on the outside and negative 6x on the inside makes that negative 12x. So really, I have a negative 1 half x and I have a 2x minus 3 squared. So this factor right here makes a 0 of, let's see, add the 3 divided by 2, 3 halves. Set this equal to 0, add the 3 divided by 2. This guy right here makes x equals 0. So I got two zeros. This guy's repeated only one time. That's his exponent, so he's going to cross at 0. This guy right here, this 0 got repeated twice. That's even, so I'm not going to cross at 3 halves. I'm going to touch. So quick graph, here's 0. 3 halves is 1.5 approximately, about right there. So I'm going to cross here and touch here. Or, or I could go the other way real quick because there is a negative exponent there. So cross, touch, come back down. So it's important you understand about repeated zeros. That just means you have an exponent out here. And even cross or touch, odd, it's going to cross. And that's it for section 2.2. .2.